Hello, welcome to the New Stack Makers, a podcast where we talk about at scale application development, deployment, and management. KubeCon, Cloud NativeCon conferences gather adopters and technologists to further the education and advancement of cloud native computing. The vendor neutral events feature domain experts and key maintainers behind popular projects like Kubernetes, Prometheus, Envoy, Core DNS, Container D, and more. Hey everyone. Welcome to a new episode of the New Stack Makers. Today, our discussion is about project momentum, essentially in open source projects. How do they grow? How do they develop? And how are they sustained over time? My guests today are four people who are very familiar with this topic. We have Michael Michael, Director of Product Management at VMware. Hey, Hey, Alex. How are you? Thank you for having us. You're welcome. Travis Nielsen, Senior Principal Software Engineer at Red Hat. Yes, hello. Good to be with you. Thanks, Alex. Annette Cluett, Principal Architect at Red Hat. Hi, hi, Alex. Thank you. Rob Zinsky, Senior Manager, Product Management, OpenShift Red Hat. Hey, Rob. Hey there. Happy to be here. Great. I just want to get right started into the questions here. You know, the topic is how project managers talk about project growth and momentum. Maybe you guys can tell us about the projects that you work on and and in what capacity. Let's start with you, Annette. I work mostly on the the Rook project and um, mostly on on taking what Travis and others do and bringing it downstream into... um, an offering that we have at Red Hat called OpenShift Container Storage. So I've done a lot of testing and, and work upstream, but my my main deal is, you know, to, to try to get it downstream. And um, we'll talk about it more, but, but basically, you know, ev- everything that we've done is first upstream and then comes downstream. So there's there's really, you know, no, no, no sync issue with that. Um, so I'll let others speak about that more. Yeah, and I think we'd love to hear your perspective about working with customers downstream and how it reflects on the upstream project. So yeah. we can discuss that more as we get into it. Travis. Sure. Yep. So I work on the Rook project. I'm one of the original maintainers and creators of Rook. Um, it's well going on four years already now since since the inception where we you know, saw a need for storage in Kubernetes, and um, and Rook was born. So today, yep, I've still been maintaining the project, um, and we, you know, we've got features. We bring them in when customers ask for them, when we see a need for them. We have all sorts of things around. You know, what do people need for storage in Kubernetes? Excellent, Michael. Michael. Uh, from my perspective, I own a lot of the open source tooling and technologies that we have uh, here at VMware in our business unit. Uh, very specifically, from the CNCF standpoint, I own uh, both Harbor as well as Contour. So one of them is an open source uh, registry, and the other one is an open source ingress controller for Kubernetes. Uh, from a product standpoint, I think you know one of the main goals that I have is to facilitate and ensure we have a healthy ecosystem for our projects to grow. Uh, that means a couple of things. The, the number one thing, it means that we have the right contributors and the right set of folks are unblocked in their effort to contribute to the project. So that means that we track all sorts of metrics. You know, how long does it take for a PR to be approved? Um, you know, uh, how is our documentation adequate for a new user or a new contributor to come into our project and and uh, help us in any way, whether that's writing documentation, fixing a bug, filing a bug, or all of those things. And then most importantly, you know, what does it mean for our users? Um, how can they contribute? Uh, can they, do they have the, are we accepting uh, feedback in terms of bugs that they file? Um, are we open them asking for new features? Uh, do we, how do we prioritize this and do we do that in the open so that everybody has an opportunity to provide feedback and influence the prioritization exercise? 
So all of those things are things that we do in pretty much all the open source projects that I lead, especially the ones that are CNCF because we're under open governance. We want everybody to have a voice, uh, have an opportunity to have a seat at the table, and most importantly, help us grow those projects. So Rob, uh, tell us about your project. Maybe you could also talk about goal setting that you do with a project and you know, I guess the question is, do you always set one or is it something that uh, evolves organically? Yeah, yeah, that's a great segue because uh, so I'm here to talk about operators and I look after a lot of the operator related um, efforts that we have at Red Hat. And that's primarily our operator SDK and then our operator lifecycle manager, um, two of the tools that help you build and then run operators. And uh, the goal that we've been uh, moving towards for a long time now was getting into the CNCF. And so I'm happy to report that that just happened. Um, so both of those tools, what we call the operator framework, are to be joining the CNCF as an incubation uh, level. And so uh, we're really happy about that. And that's kind of um, the long-term goal that we've been uh, moving forward. But really, the, like I guess our, our Uber long-term goal is to make operators a thing. Operators are a new way of writing software to utilize Kubernetes APIs to do uh, really complex things on top of Kube, like run distributed systems um, that abstract away things that aren't ex exactly in Kube. So there's no uh, concept of like data rebalancing for a database. Um, in Kube, there's no Kube object for that, but uh, you can do that on top with the operator framework. And so we teach folks how to think about writing this type of software, how it's different than other pieces of software they might write, and then how to go to market with that with customers. Um, and so it's a lot of open source uh, and that's kind of our long-term goal. And so um, now we're kind of need to pick up the next goal uh, after incubation, which is you know succeeding up into higher levels of the CNCF. Travis, how does that correlate to your work and in, in setting goals for the project? You've been with Rook since its start, haven't you? That's right. And I was going to say, you know, Rook, you know, we've done everything we can for open governance, you know, to make sure that we're doing what the community wants. And also with the CNCF, you know, we've pro progressed from you know, sandbox to incubating. And now we're in the final voting stages of, of graduation and actually hoping that that's done by the time this is broadcast at KubeCon. So we're, we're really close. Um, we've just you know, had a great time you know, with the community and, and getting that acceptance uh, running in production and all of that. Um, but then, you know, as far as, um, you know, operators, like Rob was saying, you know, Rook is an operator. Uh, we do things in the way that Kubernetes needs them to be done. We call the Kubernetes APIs and you know, respond to a desired state events. Uh, but back to your original question, I'm not sure I answered it yet. Uh, what was that again? Oh, I was just was asking about, you know, how you set your goals for your projects and um, do you always set one? Is it something that you do organically or is it something more that you uh, uh, see? Yeah, I mean, is it something you, you see happen over time? You know, setting goals for the project, it, you know, it's def it definitely happens somewhat organically, but we also have a roadmap where we say, hey, people are asking for these features. We know we need to work on these other features. So we, we try and update our roadmap periodically so that not only do we know what we're working on next, but, we, but our upstream users know what, what's coming next and what they can expect and look for. We kind of view these goals into multiple dimensions. One of it is like features. You know, what is it that you want to build? And 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 like was mentioned for Rook. And by the way, Rook team, hopefully you graduate soon. And uh, you know, we're very excited about your project. So uh, you guys are have been amazing as well. When we kind of look at this, you know, the first one is, is features, right? What is it that we're going to develop? Uh, and it's very important to have a roadmap that's publicly maintained, that's visible to everybody, so that other users that are interested in a particular topic, you know know when it's going to come. And if they're interested in bringing that date further in, they can come in and contribute and help us. Um, there Or another company that's interested in investing in a project and attending, taking a dependency, they know when that's going to be uh, aligning. The second set of goals is what I call logistical goals. You know, where do we want our community to be? Like, what kind of documentation do we want to improve? Are there any processes that we want to basically fix up? Uh, I'll give you an example. There's a common in, in infrastructure initiatives badge. Uh, think of this as a best practices on how to develop open source software. 
And there's different levels. There's the passing level, there's a silver level, there's the gold level. Uh, all of my projects, I want them to advance. Every year, I want them to move up in that, in the, in the badge that they get in that C2 badging. So there's, when we view goals, I want to make sure that both the health of the project keeps advancing and those are some goals. And there's also the features goals. So uh, that's kind of how we, how we approach it. Annette, I'm curious, you know, how you see projects, goals at the downstream, you know, when you're working with customers downstream. And I know that a lot of what is developed upstream is reflected clearly, you know, in, in, uh, in, in what you see with uh, customers and what they're experiencing. Uh, is it clear when the goals are pretty well defined? Um, or, you know, or, or are the problems kind of a different set of a different context? Um, I, I would say, you know, the, the, the goals are, are well defined. And I was going to say also, it's, uh, I work also with the Ceph CSI team. Uh, container storage interface is really, uh, as it matures, is really important to day two operations like, uh, you know, backing up, snapshotting, mirroring that are going to enable um, multi-cluster capability for multiple Kubernetes uh, to, to uh, be able to keep state and be able to mirror storage and things like that. But I, I, I think, it, you know, the, the goals are clear. I think, you know, there's still some struggles like between, say, Ceph, CSI and Rook about how um, those two projects integrate and and to, to create essentially a solution, like a solution of snapshot or a solution of mirroring, right? That's a solution, but it's basically two different projects, two different teams. Yeah, that creates, does that, how, do, how does that reflect when you're talking to customers? Well, you know, they're not as much into the details of, of the projects. They're right. more in the solution. So it's it's really up to, I guess, all of us in the community to, to drive it as a solution um, where, con like I said, container storage interface is, is an excellent one because without it, um, and since we totally use it for upstream and downstream, you know, we, we need the features to be there. And those features are very much wanted by at least customers. They're talking about them anyway, doing multi-cluster having, you know, true backup on Kubernetes. So they, they, they want those, those, those features, but we have to, you know, as a, as a community, have to put it all together. I'm sorry, something I would add to that too, is that, you know, while the CSI and Rook projects are independent projects and we fix things independently, you know, Rook is the integration point so that, you know, when you install Rook, you get, the latest version of CSI with it or whatever version we, we recommend. Mm -hmm. So the operator can control that and you can tell the operator if you want a different version, but by default, we will give you a recommended version so that the user, at the end of the day, I mean, the admin doesn't want to coordinate a bit of software, but if he wants to, then we have that flexibility for, for him to configure or them to configure that. Just yeah, I think that's the most important part of yeah. using the operator. You, you carry that knowledge that you both have in, in baking it into the project so that not every admin has to be an expert on CSI, for example. You just say, I, I need a solution that works and I trust the open source community to give it to me. Mm -hmm. So when you're, develop, when you're developing out these projects, you, um, for instance, with operators, you know, what are some of the core I guess, you know, concepts that you're th you, you've been thinking about since the start that are influencing the project today and helping it move forward. And how do you then help build that into the momentum of the project so you get it right? So like the people feel like they can, they'll contribute to this project and, and you know, over a long period of time, because I think that's really what you want, isn't it? To have that longer term sustainability. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. And I'll talk about this from a tooling perspective, but then I also want to recognize that it's also on the individual teams that are building operators to, you know, accept 
uh, changes to their tooling and things like that. Um, so we think about like in terms of the operator SDK, getting you a really quick scaffold of a new environment. So we do some code generation for you. So you don't need to be an expert in how to connect to the Kubernetes API and authenticate with it and put a layer of caching uh, between you and the API server and some other things that you need to do like that. We just want you to bring your business logic. Um, so how your database or your machine learning application or whatever it is that you're running, your storage system works. Um, and so we think that's really important for getting folks uh, up and running. And then uh, where we progress past that is getting things like all the advanced webhook support. Um, so, for example, you know, uh, webhooks for doing mutating admission and, you know, these, those need TLS and those certs need to be rotated and um, you might want to instrument them with monitoring and, and all that kind of stuff. And so we try to bring that for you so you don't have to reinvent that. But then it's folks like uh, Annette and Travis that then need to go implement that stuff and adapt the webhook for exactly what their operator needs to do how it needs to maintain high availability, et cetera. Um, so it's kind of a give and take there, and that's where you have to work with the community to get it done. Hmm. So how have you seen Great. that develop, Travis and, and Annette? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, with Rook, yeah. yeah, it's been very critical that you know, with the CRDs, for example, the CRDs are the custom resource definitions is where the custom, custom customizability <laughs> comes in. And the admin can change the settings. So if if the, we aren't exposing enough flexibility, you know, we we welcome community members to come and oh, add, let's add a new setting to the to the CRD, or let's do this a little differently so you can control it through the operator. And yeah, and we've had uh, over 250 individual contributors now in the Rook project just over time. Of course, not all of them are active um, currently, but there have been a lot of people contributing to say, hey, I want this a little better lots of different companies contributing that way. Yeah. And, and I would say downstream teaching uh, customers about operators, especially if they're very knowledgeable, for example, using stuff in a, in a native form. And it's hard for them to understand that they don't need to go into Ceph and change anything that we've already turned the knobs. The operators mm -hmm. turn the knobs and actually it's detrimental for them to go in and try to change the knobs. So uh, Travis is absolutely right that, you know, we, we need to take the feedback if needed, make the change so the operator turns the knob, not the, not the, the customer who may be very self knowledgeable, but we're asking them to basically, you know, trust us. <laughs> so, what happens? What happens when they twist the knob? What are some of the things? Well, it depends which knob they twist, but if, if, it, if, it, if the operator reconciles, it, it could just change it right back. Mm. Yeah. So, so Michael, in, in, in your, in your projects, um, you look at, you know, Harbor is one of the projects. Harbor has been a pretty popular project, uh, in, in the cloud native, uh, ecosystem. How, how did the momentum change in that project? What did you see happen in the project that changed the momentum or you no, know, or how does momentum change overall for projects when you're thinking about it? Is it something you see from the start or, you know, what are the, you know, what are the various patterns that, that you've uh, experienced and seen? Yeah, I kind of, uh, what I've seen, not only with our projects, Harbor, Contour and others, but also overall in the community, is there kind of two inflection points that kind of change the momentum. The first one is, when the community realizes that the project feels a need, it feels a void, it does something that nobody else did before, or maybe invented a better mousetrap, does something a lot better. That's, that's kind of the first inflection point. But in order for you to achieve that as a project, enough community, enough people in the community need to be aware of it. So how does that happen? And maybe one of it is that it grows organically. You know, you show up in some Kubernetes community meetings, you do road shows, you go to events like uh, Kubicon conferences and you talk about your project and then you gain momentum that way. The second way is by basically being part of the CNCF and advancing through the, through the ranks, uh, sandbox, incubation to graduation. So as, as you get into CNCF and you're getting that initial stamp of approval that, you know, your project has the right governance, the right technical team in place, it meets certain requirements that the CNCF has in place for you to advance um, within the ecosystem, that 
you know, that's the second inflection point. So um, what I've seen is throughout both of those points is that you get a flurry of additional eyeballs into your project. And those eyeballs could be uh, developers that are coming in and contributing to your project and advancing your vision, or it could be users of your project that are coming in and giving you new feature ideas, new areas where you can uh, influence the direction of the project and the roadmap, or or they're helping you in other ways, like, you know, chop wood and cut water, as we say in the Kubernetes community, you know, whether they're helping with testing, documentation, uh, filing bugs, uh, all the activities are maybe are not as uh, sexy as writing code and becoming a maintainer. So when you're thinking about that momentum in the project, a lot of it has to come down to consistency, doesn't it? And uh, and how consistent the project is in its overall uh, um, structure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of, a lot of um, users are looking at the project and they're thinking about, hey, I see that project feels a need, it feels a void, uh, you know, um, can I make a bet on it? One of the things first things they want to see is, is there, what's the overall health of the project? Is there consistency in contributions, commits, PRs over a long period of time? I don't want to make a bet on a project that's going to be unmaintainable in half a year or a year from now. I don't want to make a bet on a project that doesn't have that forward-looking trajectory and momentum. So yes, consistency is very important. So Rob, how have you done that with, uh, you know, with your projects? Because operators are fairly new. But they're also very popular. They're like becoming the hotness. Yeah. So in the tools themselves, we've tried to uh, make sure that, you know, we've actually just launched some new uh, websites for the open source projects instead of just documentation living in GitHub. Um, and so we want to kind of talk about how uh, we have two tools, the SDK and the Lifecycle Manager, how uh, they're documented separately. And, you know, they have different maturities um, and uh, roadmaps and backlogs and things like that. Um, but then they also document how to use them together. Now, our framework, you don't have to use them together, but that is kind of where you get some consistency is when tools are introduced on one, uh, you can use them in the other. And we think that's really powerful. Um, and so then there's um, kind of how each operator is documented uh, and communicated about what it can do. And so what we did really early on is establish a maturity model for operators or capability level. Um, so it goes from one to five and talks about things from like this operator handles basic install all the way to um, it's kind of like the smartest thing you've ever seen auto scaling vertically and horizontally. It's got full um, monitoring and automation and remediation. Um, and so we try to communicate to folks where operators fall on that level. And we've kind of have a way of thinking about it that is good for the developers to know where to improve, but then users uh, kind of how to bet on that and how to think about it. Excellent. Annette, when you're looking at projects, you know, how, how, you know, how do you tell if a project is, you know, healthy or not healthy? I and mean, is it pretty evident when you start to, when you start to, you know, get involved in it, and you know, from a downstream point of view? Well, I don't, I don't have a lot of experience with a lot of different projects, um, but in terms of what, what Red Hat has decided to put, you know, effort into, I think that that's certainly a sign, right? If, if a company like VMware or Red Hat puts, out, puts time into that project and, you know, investigates and, then it literally starts using it as a component in a particular solution. Um, that certainly gives the project, I think, more notoriety as well as just more people want to contribute, right? It, it's, it's, a, um, it's cyclic in terms of, you know, people are interested in things that, that are actually being used and, and, you know, the other people outside of the community have an opportunity to, to actually, you know, try and, and test. So, mm -hmm. so I, I, I think, you know, eventually if, if, if a project isn't picked up and, and somehow, and, and, and maybe, you know, maybe not, but in some way uh, commercialized in some way, it seems like eventually, you know, uh, that's going to be difficult to sustain. When you're thinking about the overall structure of the community itself, you know, open source communities have been defined in similar ways for a long time, and you all are, uh, you know, have experience in open source projects. What are the hierarchies that 
you you find effective? How are they changing? In how are you seeing kind of efforts to make them more inclusive? Uh, maybe we could start with with you, uh, Michael. Um, so yeah, absolutely. The, from a hierarchy standpoint, um, we have a fairly well documented path on. Uh, how contributors can advance through the ranks of a project and and increase both their visibility, their technical ownership, as well as the, their ability to influence the vision of a project. Um, you know, out of the get-go, uh, anyone that starts contributing to a project is, is immediately a contributor. Um, so they may have reviewed PRs, uh, authored some PRs of their own, and, um, you know, we, we consider them a part of the project. They have a voice in the project. They attend community meetings. They attend our uh, meetings where we do prioritization of the backlog, uh, all of those things. Then in an effort not to have a fairly complicated ladder, uh, the next step is becoming a technical lead. So maybe you're an expert in a specific area of the project, um, you know, and in Kubernetes, for example, they have the different special interest groups and within each of them, they have technical leads. Think of it that way. So for example, deployment, um, deployment mechanics, that's an area where you can have a technical lead, like someone that's responsible for the operator of a project or a home chart or anything else that does with, it deals with lifecycle management. Um, so, so we have area owners that become the technical leads and that's basically signaling to the community that if you have a question in an area, this is the person where you go to. If you want to author a PR or architect something new in that area, this is the person that you, you want to work on on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And then, the, and then the third step uh, is becoming a maintainer. This is the stamp that you get in the community where it shows that you are a, a technical leader of the project. You, are, you have uh, a stake in the project's vision and direction. Uh, you have voting privileges on anything that's governance related to the project. So. Uh, it, from from our perspective, we want to keep it simple. Three stages, uh, and we advance folks based on their contributions to the project. From an inclusivity standpoint, obviously, our goal is to have a diverse ecosystem of contributors, users, uh, and, and maintainers. And we factor that into our decision. We, we value diversity. We want to make sure that we promote inclusiveness. So uh, in everything that we do, from our code of conduct to how we operate within the project, uh, inclusivity and, 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 and being good citizens and good represent, representatives of the project is very important to us. And CNCF, with its um, kind of standard practices for code of conduct and things like that, I think has done a really good job in uh, raising the awareness of this issue and kind of putting its foot down when it sees any sort of bad behavior. Um, so I think that that's probably one of the most successful parts of Kubernetes, obviously, other than, you know, it, its popularity for actual infrastructure deployment. How do you see it, Annette? You know, I'm not as involved uh, as, as Rob and Travis and Michael with day-to-day -day, uh, work in the project, but... Um, you know, I, I think we, we still have diversity challenges, especially in gender. Um, uh, there's no doubt about that. And uh, so, you know, we just, I think, continue to try to inspire more women to come into this, both on, on the open source side and, and the, you know, eventually, you know, like I said, getting to a commercialized product. But um, mm -hmm. so that's still a challenge. Uh, for the Rook project, I was going to add on to it, similar to what Michael said for, for their project. A Rook has different levels of um, engaging and advancing kind of in the community. So you're a contributor, then you can approve things. So if you approve a PR, then a maintainer can, can merge it. And then the maintainers are watch, watching the overall project. And maintainers also will typically focus on one of our specific storage providers, because there are multiple storage providers in Rook from Ceph and EdgeFS and Cassandra and, and a few others. So we do have specialties within the project um, where yep, you're a maintainer of that part of the project or overall. Um, and so you can, but it's definitely, oh, and there's also a steering committee. So that our steering committee says, now this is our voting body and only one member from each company can participate. Uh, so if some were, if I were to join the same company as another member of the committee, then one of us would have to drop from the committee, things like that. So the governance, yeah, the CNCF has really done a good job though of, of overseeing this governance. So it is 
open and, and inclusive. Great. Um, when you're thinking about documentation and tools and how they play a role, I'm all, I'm always curious about documentation. And Annette, I'd like to come back to you. I, I'm just curious about, you know, what it must be like when you're working with downstream customers, how crucial that documentation must be. Yeah, both both the upstream documentation and then eventually downstream. Um, yeah, it's it's very it's very crucial. And it's, it's relatively complicated as well, because um, uh, in particular, like with Roic and then the stuff the CSI, there's just a lot more capability with the product now. Um, so you have a lot of different um, areas, you know, that, that need to be documented. And, you know, it, it, is, it is in some cases... Um, difficult to keep up because we also are revving. Um, you know, if you look at, um, I think Rook, Travis can, can speak to it, but I think, you know, you're seeing a new version every, what, four months or so. Um, and, and sometimes there's a lot of new capability there uh, to, to keep track of. So it's not only just, you know, document it once and then go away. You have to keep changing uh, the documentation to keep up with, with the features and, you know, what you do with those features, like adding, you know, something to a CRD might have a certain um, capability, but if you don't know to add it, then, you know, it's not there. Travis, this bus then can create a lot of time spent, uh, you know, helping people out about specific questions if the documentation's not there. It seems like that's one of the, the bigger, larger issues that you face, kind of the documentation isn't quite up to, isn't, isn't answering their questions because you'll just get, you, you, you yourself could be finding a, a lot of time spent just answering questions that, you know, that might have been in documentation, that, that, that could be in documentation or, or otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Rook, we really, from the start, you know, really spent some time on the documentation. You know, here's our, our quick start guide, just get up to speed quickly. And then also here's the kind of the deep dive documentation with all the individual CRD settings and, you know, and making sure that each version we release is updated with the new features and still being able to go look at older versions of the documentation as well. So we've got version to documentation so people can see, oh, I'm running this version, I can look at this set of documentation. And then when people have questions on Slack or, or wherever, we can, you know, one of the most common things I'll do is just send them a link to the documentation. Hey, this should answer your question. That's an answer your question. It saves me a lot of time as a maintainer, for sure. Yeah, I, I want to add one one thing to that. So we, we do something similar. Uh, obviously, in most open source projects, you know, our goal is if your documentation is not ready, you don't get a new release out. Uh, so it's very important that, you know, the community, your downstream users, they have uh, access to what the new features you have, how to use them. Uh, all of those are, are important part of the community. And uh, earlier, I kind of mentioned about those two inflection points. You know, when you get one of those inflection points, which is more eyeballs on the project and more users and more credibility, all of that will be for nothing if you don't have good documentations and getting started guides so that all these additional users have a, a good uh, out of the box experience on your project. So that's a super, super important thing. Uh, the second thing that we do is, you know, we have a lot of interactions with users. Some of it is on GitHub, some of it is on Slack, some of it is on the mailing list that you have, where there's Google groups or CMCF mailing list. Um, some projects even have, uh, you know, they, they, um, they have their own forums where they interact with users. But the most important thing is you get questions that are repetitive. You get the same questions today and tomorrow and, and the next day. Uh, what we're asking of our teams is to keep track of all those questions. And the ones that get asked a lot, then that means that we have a gap in documentation. Maybe the documentation is there and it's not easily accessible or or users cannot find it easily. Or maybe that content is missing or it's not uh, or it's not accurate or 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 it's not uh, conclusive. So we want to, we always make a conscious effort to update that to reduce, uh, those questions. Maybe some of them will be FAQs. Some of them will be straight up documentation. So it's very important as a project to keep a pulse into what the community is asking for and address it. 
when you're looking at these times, Rob, in terms of documentation, has it become more important in these times of COVID? Um, or, or is it just the same importance or do you see more attention being put to it or less or any, any feedback about the times and how they're affecting the way people are accessing the information or how it's getting developed? Um, I think it's all kind of about the same. It's just as important as always. Um, as Mike was saying, if you get, uh, more eyes on something like a hundred or a thousand extra eyes, people are going to start filing more bugs and things like that. And so that's where I think it's most important to just smooth your contribution process. So, um, if you have a bunch of churn in your docs and you're making people rebase and, you know, they're not going to come back and do that, uh, trying to pull those PRs forward or whatever it is to make that contributor experience really nice. Um, and if you've got CI systems that are going to run and you can't see the logs for them, for example, that's going to be really hard to diagnose, obviously. Um, so I think it's like all of those systems to save everybody time. I mean, uh, depending on you look at the COVID times now, people either have more time on their hands or less time on their hands, just depending. Um, and so that's going to balance out. You just want to make everyone's life as easy as possible. What are the tools you all are using uh, now? Like, and how, 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 are, how are you helping manage, you know, what are the tools you're using to manage growth and momentum? And I'd love to just hear kind of a general idea of like your overall growth, your overall momentum of your, of your various projects. I'm going to start with you, Rob. Sure. Um, so we kind of track um, both sides of our framework um, as kind of separate projects since they are. Um, and we do a lot of things um, just looking at overall like forks of the SDK is a really good way to measure growth for us because um, folks are using that as a base to build off of. Um, and then, you know, uh, like uh, Michael was saying, you know, the um, the stats around PRs and how long they stay open and new issues and things like that are always good to get a pulse on. Um, we tend to look at our community pretty heavily too. And so um, how many folks are showing up to the meetings, um, you know, mailing list traffic and like the types of questions that people are asking um, is really good there. And then like on the tool side, in terms of, like I mentioned, we just got these new websites up. Um, so we're using Netlify to host and build those. And that's been a really great tool for us. Um, you know, one of those things uh, for infrastructure that's not free, and so Netlify is. So if you've got a group of folks, you know, someone's got to pony up the bucks for that. That's where the CNCF can help some um, and standardize some of that process. But we found that just a lot of open source tools, um, you know, different CI systems uh, work really great. And the Kube ecosystem is pretty good about these things. Um, there's a lot of uh, systems out there that are for free. Um, so, yeah, we try to make things really easy to do uh, and run and then track that they actually, you know, um, gives us growth in terms of users, people using our framework uh, overall. Yeah, so I think. Oh, Michael. Oh, go, go ahead, go ahead Michael. Are you sure? All right, thank you. So I mean, what Rob said, we track a lot of the same metrics. We see how many attendees do we get in our community meetings, what's the engagement level of those attendees. And then, you know, uh, for the projects that are in CNCF, there's a tool called DevStats that you can get really good in introspection into your project from, you know, number of PRs are being filed, commits, how many companies are contributing to your projects. And one of the things that we do in all of my projects, we, we, we track not only the health of the, the main contributors of the project thing of these like maintainers, tech leads, but we also track how many net new contributors are we getting? And we can kind of classify them into two buckets. One of buckets is, you know, the occasional person that files one PR and kind of goes away. Maybe they had a need or found a documentation bug, they'll file it, and then maybe they won't make more contributions. And we also have the second category, which is the individuals that filed more than five PRs in a time frame. Uh, the time frame could be six months or yearly. And those are the folks that we want to cultivate. They were interested in the project. They had a more than uh, minimal effort into the project. So filing five PIRs is not a small feat. That means they were interested in the project. We want to make sure we encourage those and we increase the number of contributors. So we want to increase how many contributors uh, make more than a meaningful contribution to the project. We want to grow them and we want to learn from them so that we can get more of those. Um, and then there's also all sorts of other statistics that, that we track in terms of, you know, um, you know, the growth of the project, like the standard stuff. How many stars are you getting? How many forks are you getting? Some of the things that people put in a presentation when talking about the project, we want to make sure that those also are, are growing. Uh, GitHub also give you, gives you some cool statistics, like, you know, for example, how many downloads did you get of your latest release? We track that. So, for example, when we release version 1.0, x and version 1.x plus one we track one versus the other how many downloads did you get on the first month does that mean that 
individuals and users are upgrading or not? Or are they waiting for the dot one release of that, of the point one? Uh, or how many unique new visitors do you get on GitHub? We also look at those because they give you, um, when you collectively look at all these metrics, they give you an accurate picture of the health of your project. Yeah, and as far as the Rook project, uh, you know, similar metrics, again, that we track. I feel like we, we do things a little more organically on the Rook project. We uh, focus a lot on the engineering, you know, how are our PRs doing? Are we keeping them up to date and making sure... Uh, people are getting the feedback in a timely manner so that they can update them and, and we can get them merged before they go stale. You know, when people open issues, making sure that, that we're responding in a timely way. Um, anytime there's some issue that goes stale, I think it's a question that, oh, either, you know, have we done our part to respond to those issues in PRs um, or are, are we not? Because if we're not doing our part, then the community will, will wither and, and not be as interested. So proactively tracking, you know, are we responding to issues? It's kind of a key metric that, that I like to keep track of. What tools would you like to see? What are the tools that are missing? What are the, some of the tools that you would like better uh, that would that would be uh, more that be helpful for you. And that, from a downstream point of view, are there any tools in particular that that uh, you'd like to see to provide more visibility, for instance? Yeah, I don't know if it's a tool, but um, I was thinking when you were chatting about it. But what one of, one of the things I think, and this would be be for you, Rob. But you know, we we have this sense of you know operators being connected or disconnected. So an operator is something that continually sort of keeps track and, and updates itself. And, you know, the, the idea is that you, you don't have to worry about it. It'll take care of itself. Well, that works well as long as you are connected, meaning you, you have access to the Internet. But if you're not, then you become disconnected and all that sort of doesn't work so well. So there are ways, um, and, and Rob's very familiar with them, of making... Um, making that a much better process. And we do, we are seeing a lot of disconnected use of, of Kubernetes. So I, I just would like to see as a tool standardization, not, not just for Red Hat operators or such, but for community operators that they, they follow certain guidelines and, and possibly that they do testing in environments where they're not connected. Because I can tell you, it's, yeah. it's some really bad days <laughs> trying to get it to work. Mm. Yeah, and I would expand on that. I think just uh, testing in general, I think it would be really great as if um, the CNCF sponsored some centralized testing infrastructure for all of the certified Kube distros um, so that you could say, go test this operator on all these different types of clusters because um, the connected disconnected is one of them, but all the different distros have like different authentication requirements and how they plug into the different clouds and things like that. And so if you're trying to support an operator on all of them, um, it just becomes this giant matrix to test. And, you know, every company that's producing a commercial version has all this internally, um, but we could share probably a ton of it in the open source and that would be really powerful, but expensive, which is the problem. Mike, uh, Michael, what kind of tool would you like to see? What are some of the tools that you are, you see, you see are missing? Um, we're not, Seeing a lot of uh, need from a tooling perspective, I think that, you know, either homegrown or organically, you know, source some tooling that, that basically made our lives easier. Uh, but, you know, a lot of times you kind of look at bigger projects like Kubernetes and look at the processes and the tooling they have uh, to make our lives easier because we learn from them. You know, how do they deploy the documentation? How do they version things? How do they keep track of uh, project health? You know, we've kind of learned from them and, you know, either use some of the tooling and processes that they have. So nothing kind of pops up to mind that, that we need today as a project. But obviously, you know, one of the great things of the CNCF and, and, and other ecosystems like it is that, you know, you have this, you know, continuous uh, um, engagement with the, with the foundation. So when there are things that you find that your project could use to make you more effective or, 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 you know, uh, reduce duplication, we ask for those. And the CNCF has been really good about, uh, providing and, and making sure that we are, we have, um, you know, everything that we need to succeed as a project. I'd like to move into just this idea of the health and welfare of the community and i'm curious on how you take care of yourselves and how do you support you know how do you think support is for maintainers and 
what's important in that in terms of the overall project and its growth and momentum. And really, how have these views changed, you know, over the past several years and, and what's better, what's worse? And some of the new pre- pressures that you're grappling with in, you know, in your work. And maybe we can start with you, Travis, uh, for some general perspectives. Sure. Um, you know, I think, you know, some of a lot of this has already been said as far as how, how projects are run and every project is different, but you know, having the regular community meetings is, is really helpful just to get, let's get whoever from the community wants to together to get project status, to have open discussions from topics. And, and the people that are in those meetings will, will come and go. Uh, but that having that touch point to talk, have a real conversation is important instead of just the Slack or, or the other applications like that, or just chatting on, on GitHub issues. It's, it's nice to be able to talk. Of course, someday we'll be able to go to conferences, being able to talk to people in, in the booth where people who are interested in your project come and, and you have a great conversation about their requirements and, you know, how the project can fill their needs or what's missing in the project. So that's, that is my favorite part of, of the conferences. Um, you know, other things, uh, there, there's a whole, a whole range from just keeping the communication line open. On, on Slack and, uh, and other means. But yeah, I think that's what comes to mind. Yeah, and, and I'll agree with Travis, all, like, you know, all of those things, we, we do them across the board. You know, you have your regular community meetings where there's a regular cadence, users know when to expect that they can engage with the rest of the community. And then we also have uh, infrequent uh, maintainer-only meetings. So this is when all your maintainers get to discuss, you know, project health. Uh, and usually that happens at the beginning of a new release when we're doing prioritization and trying to make sure that, you know, all the big rocks of what we want to achieve, we have an owner for and someone that's going to help drive that. So that's that's super important to us. But like Travis said, you know, you know, a big part of building these communities is seeing folks face to face and Conferences like Cubicon around the world and, and other cloud native uh, conferences organized by the Linux Foundation were very critical in engaging with the community face to face. Sometimes you hear something and feedback from someone, whether individual or a company that you wouldn't see in Slack, but in person you get to talk about the project and these things come out. And hopefully one day we can get back to these face to face conferences. Yeah, I was just going to add, uh, I think, you know, the, since we can't meet face to face, um, whatever support groups that you have for, you know, maintainers to talk amongst themselves and all that is super important, especially as just, you know, folks sometimes forget that there is a human on the other side of every GitHub issue and every tweet and every email. Um, and so, uh, as our, our lives are just high stress in general these days, uh, with COVID and other things that, um, you know, just remember there's a human on, on the other side of it. And then all the, all the folks try to support each other. You know, we're all in this together. Uh, we all want this software to succeed. And then w- one last thing I forgot to say is that, you know, depending on, you know, usually projects that have one or two uh, companies that are backing them, like, for example, here we have Red Hat and VMware that are backing uh, a set of projects. We, w- at least we from our side, we try to, uh, to uh, give our maintainers like something every year. Like think of it as uh, some swag, like... Uh, a couple of t-shirts of the project, a hoodie, a mug, uh, or anytime someone has went above and beyond uh, what's required by the project to either solve a, a difficult problem or engage with a user that had a, a, a big issue and they were looking for community support, uh, anything like that, we try to make sure that we reward those folks. Uh, I'll give you an example the other day in the Kubernetes community. Um, I'm also a chair in one of the SIGs in Kubernetes. And one, one of my, uh, one of my contributors, you know, went above and beyond solving a problem that, that the user had. And this is ad hoc best effort support, right? We don't have an SLA or an SLO as a Kubernetes project. So what I did is I gave him a gift card to the CNCF store to pick up a, a t-shirt of his choosing. It's kind of a, a nice gesture to show to uh, to our contributors and our maintainers that their that their contributions is super valued uh, valued by everybody. Annette, what are the challenges, new pressures that you're seeing uh, with you know you know in in open source 
overall in terms of projects you're working on in particular? I mean, I would, you know, Rook and specifically, are there new pressures that you're starting to see? I mean, you know, and just generally to that question about, you know, uh, health and welfare, is it, is there anything that you reflect upon? Yeah, um, I guess two things. One is since most people I work with are no longer traveling, it actually took time to travel, like go to the East Coast to West Coast. So what I'm finding is um, you have to be careful that, you know, you're not putting in 11, 12 hour days ongoingly because there's no, there's no breaks anymore, right? So that's just something um, I think, uh, you know, th there's, there's, there's just no break. So you have to be careful to continue to, um, you know, take care of yourself. Um, the other thing is, it seems like in certain um, areas that the, that the, the customers, the, the people that are trying to use this uh, software and capability, that they have more of an urgency. Um, and because they're also not traveling, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, you know, we're, we're seeing that there's some of these features that we're developing are being called for quite quickly. And um, I'm not sure how that's going to work out, but I think, you know, there's, there's, there's definitely some, some um, urgency with, with getting some of these features available. Do, do you all, do my, Michael... Uh, Rob, do you see those similar pressures? All right. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Rob. Go ahead, Rob. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would say that folks just have such a high bar for user experience these days that they expect software just to be very high quality. Um, the software, the documentation, the release process, you know, we're all humans and not everybody gets everything right the first time. Um, but that bar is so high and that's great for living in this world. Um, but when you're the one producing that software, uh, you know, it, it can put more pressure on you. And like Annette said, you know, Folks want everything yesterday. Their priority is the highest priority, things like that. Um, so you just have to step away sometimes and just, you know, we're going to get to it next release and that's okay. Uh, that's what I would say. Yeah, and, and, and to add to what Rob said, you know, uh, I see that across the, the board, including even in Kubernetes, they need everything yesterday. And uh, for us, it's, it's in, you know, and it's open source and it's free software, right? So, uh, uh, and, and every contributor is not always from a specific company where they're paying for their time to work on the project. Some contributors are basically doing it out of the goodness of their hearts because they love the project, they love the ideas of the project. And, and you know, you have to be very careful to make sure that uh, everybody has the freedom to innovate at their pace. And if something makes it in, great. And if it doesn't, then other individuals can come in and contribute to bring the data in or let it come at its own pace. And it's very important for us to make sure that we empower all these contributors to uh, to contribute at, at the level of, of effort that they are uh, comfortable with. Especially now in this new age of COVID where everybody's working a tremendous amount of hours, you know, they're, they're at home all day long, they're being in meetings all day long. Uh, it's very hard to find time to contribute on projects if it's not your daytime job. So what's next then for the community? What do you see as uh, uh, emerging in the CNCF that will uh, help projects uh, be more sustainable? What, what's important to you uh, going forward? And I'd like just to make this our last question. So, so just any last thoughts is, you know, would be helpful. That's a really good question. I'll just chime in by saying, I mean, the CNCF leaves the leaves the execution of the project up to the project owners, so they don't they don't come down and say you have to do things this way. I mean, they're just open. It's an open source community, and and they they give us the flexibility to to drive our projects as we see fit. So honestly, as far as the community or the ecosystem, um, I'm not sure what's next I, I feel like let's keep executing we have all the, these patterns in place for great open source governance and you know to keep keep going down this path of uh, um, an open community and making it inclusive for everyone uh, i like what travis mentioned i mean they, we have a lot of freedom to uh progress our projects uh in their own pace uh so that's very important i think the one thing that i look forward to is 
you know, as you have more and more projects that either have a, not necessarily a singular goal, but they have goals that align with each other. I'll give you an example. There's a um, there's an effort happening called Service APIs, which is basically uh, an effort to introduce a new way to bring networking traffic to your applications running in Kubernetes. Like uh, some folks call it Ingress V2. Well, that specific effort spans multiple projects. It spans Kubernetes, that's a graduate project. It spans Contour, which is an Ingress controller. Uh, it spans Ambassador, that's trying to get into the CNCF right now. It spans Envoy, which is a proxy that basically could be one of the components that routes traffic. So one of the things I'm looking forward is, you know, as you have the special interest groups at the CNCF level, for example, networking special interest group, I'm looking forward to kind of joining a lot of these efforts together. So everybody develops on, on an open, uh, on an open specification and we align our efforts to produce the best type of service APIs that you can, uh, taking into account in all of the different pieces that each project brings in. I think that's the beauty of a foundation, that you can have multiple projects coming in together to contribute towards a single goal. Yeah, I would say, um, similar to what Michael said, I, I think that, you know, there needs to be at, at, at the level of, um, at KubeCon, as well as training, just how, how to put these projects together. I mean, the solution for multi-cluster um, is, is a really important one and it's going to, it's going to require a lot of different efforts that need to work together. And I, I know it's, you know, it's been, been working on that for a long time, but today, um, I, I think, you know, we're, we're going to see that demand. We already see that demand and, and I don't really feel like we have a, a baked solution as a community. Yeah, that's a good point. And that's the holy grail of Kubernetes. And so we need to get there as soon as possible. Um, I'll just close out by saying, uh, as everyone else on the call is already kind of working in uh, CNCF projects, uh, ours are new to the CNCF. And so we're just excited to, you know, we've been uh, trialing uh, the enhancement proposals that are Kubernetes style for a while, but, you know, we're going to make that official with our join, um, as well as, you know, we've had community meetings, but we're going to adopt a lot of the CNCF infrastructure for doing that and just uh, make sure everybody that can participate wants to and all that type of stuff. Um, so nothing too much is going to change for us, but it's just going to solidify it a little bit more. And so we're pretty excited to uh, kind of get up and stuff on how uh, CNCF does that. Well, I want to thank you all for participating in this discussion about project momentum and open source communities and open source projects. I want to just go around the horn and thank everyone. Michael Michael, Director of Product Management of VMware. Thank you, Michael, for being here. Travis, thank you. You're welcome. Travis Nielsen, Senior Principal Software Engineer, Red Hat. Thanks, Travis. Yeah, it's been great to be here. Thank you, Alex. Annette Cluet, Principal Architect at Red Hat. Really appreciate your perspectives, Annette. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you. And Rod Zumski, Senior Manager, Product Management, at OpenShift Red Hat. Thanks for joining. Absolutely. You thank you. You bet. Listen to more episodes of the New Stack Makers at the newstack.io slash podcast. Please rate and review us on iTunes, like us on YouTube, and follow us on SoundCloud. Thanks for listening, and see you next time. KubeCon, Cloud NativeCon conferences gather adopters and technologists to further the education and advancement of cloud native computing. The vendor-neutral events feature domain experts and key maintainers behind popular projects like Kubernetes, Prometheus, Envoy, CoreDNS, ContainerD, and more.